we imagine education after open ceremony <laughs> so um we have some um, people whose faces i can see some people whose faces i cannot see i hope you are there i hope you are cozy and have a cup of tea i have my cup of tea so i don't know if you can um, put a, a gallery view uh, on your zoom if you know it's like on the top right you can choose to either see who's speaking on who is on gallery and uh, i could invite you to just for 15 seconds just see the faces of the people who are here imagining that we were on a room with a round table and uh, we could see the other people who are present and then we're going to go for a great coffee break because i'm getting hungry <laughs> And um, the first thing we would like to do, I, I and Albert will be just um, hosting this uh, discussion panel. We have our wonderful three speakers uh, who are here to share their work for the publication circle of Ecoversities. So Albert, would you like to share with us a little bit what is the publication circle? Um, yeah. Um... The Ecoversities Alliance has many circles. Um, one of these is the publications. Um, we, they are not only text, text publications, but we also engage with audio, audiovisuals, which could be films or podcasts. And there is a process um, to these publications because um, Sometimes we make open calls and we receive tons of um, submissions, but to see for them to see the light of day, um, it takes a lot of time from the leaders and this um, peer to peer conversation with the authors. Um, it is a journey to write something and to go through the editorial um, process. Um, and there's also a difference when you start that relationship with your publication. When you, when you write it and when you, and the time that it is released into the world, um, you are two different persons. And this is a whole pedagogical process um so i feel that that's the aspiration of this panel um to see how writing um does not change only the reader but also the author herself or himself um it is almost as if the words um take life of their own and start walking um out of the page of the book or the screen. Um, we also are doing this experiment of the Cover Cities magazine, which my friend Tira um, is in charge of edit editing. And what we seek with this Cover Cities magazine is to bring many voices into a circle of conversation and unexpected alliances and permutation is like this um, a stone soup where everyone brings something in, initial and something new emerges from that. Um, I hope that this panel is that stone soup and we can have some really nice conversations and yeah, I think that's that's it for the Core Cities Publications um, Circle. Now, shall we go with the speakers? Um, Stephanie will start. Um, do you want me to introduce you, Stephanie? Am I go going too fast? <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you, Albert. I'm ready. Um, if there's anything you want to say, go for it. And if not, we can roll. 
into it. <laughs> okay. Um, then our first speaker, um, she's here from Costa Rica. Um, she's originally from the US. It's our friend, Stephanie Knox Steiner. Stephanie is a mother. She's a peace educator, mindfulness practitioner. She received her PhD from the Pacifica Graduate Institute in Community Liberation and Eco, and eco, eco psycho, Psychology with a specialty in community and indigenous ecophysiologists psychologist, um, pardon. Um, she's currently an assistant professor in the Peace and Conflict Studies at the University for Peace in Costa Rica. Um, she has collaborated with Baya Comolafe for our arrows and trained with Joanna Macy, Tignat Han and Meg Whitley. And her relationship with the course cities is that she has been with us. Um, she came here at first to a reimagining education conference. And then she gave us a piece which is called Dissertation as a Crack in the Cracks. Um, which is kind of a um, it's emerged from her doctoral thesis, um, which he um, collaborated with Raya Kumolar. Um I'm not sure if I'm missing anything, Stani. <laughs> um, she will give us a little poem and then well, let's speak more about that word she inhabits. Um, it's all yours, Stephanie. <laughs> thank you, dear Albert, and thank you, friends. It is so wonderful to be with you this morning. It's wonderful to see old faces, new to me faces. Um, it's just wonderful, wonderful to be together. I'm going to begin by reading you the opening invocation to my piece, um, which I edited a little bit this morning, inspired by reading uh, Reham and Shane's pieces and also the opening ceremony. So just changed a few words um, and or added a few words in there as well. So I invite you to settle in and allow yourself to arrive. If you were at the opening ceremony, there was a little transition. So I offer this invocation as a, a, tr a moment to mark the, the transition into this space. And thank you, Albert, for that beautiful, warm introduction as well. So an Ecoverse welcoming invocation. Welcome, dear friends of the Ecoverse, fellow travelers on this path. Welcome bodies, welcome breath, welcome ancestors. Welcome sky, sun, moon, stars, celestial beings. Welcome land and territories that are holding us in our respective interconnected places. Welcome transistors, silicon, computers, phones, and the many other elements that make our togetherness possible. Welcome to the many beings that are part of us. May they support us. We are here joined by these words, our breath, our existence on this precious planet, our shared dream of reimagining education towards being in service to life. May our aspirations guide us. I am so glad our paths have intersected here. Let's begin in the spirit of Ubuntu together. So thank you so much, dear friends. I, I am so glad our paths have intersected here. 
And that opening gives you a little window into the piece that I wrote as well, although I really offer it in the spirit of welcoming us today. Um, and I was really touched, Albert, by what you, how you started by sharing about the process of writing a piece for Ecoversities, because I think when, when I was invited to speak on the panel, that was really what resonated the most or what, what I felt like I might offer, um, just thinking about the process itself and how beautiful and emergent and entangled it has been. Um, I began, came across Ecoversity some time ago, and then when REC was happened, the first REC in 2020 um, was around the time I was starting my dissertation writing. And so I had been reimagining education for, I don't know, maybe many years <laughs> before that, but um, found myself at REC at this moment when I was also seeking people to be in conversation with around this topic. And through the first REC, I um, became into relationship with a number of people who um, ended up participating in my dissertation research. So REC really informed and is infused in that piece of a body of work. Um, and then as I was ending the writing part of the dissertation process, Ecoversities put out this call for publications and I thought, well, I, I could probably write something about it. And then, so I submitted a proposal and received a response. Yes, we would really love you to write about that. And then the way the publication process worked, I was um, I worked closely with two editors, Dina Bantaina and Michelle Tehran, who are both part of the alliance, um, part of the network, the Ecoverse. And it was such a joy working with Dina and Michelle. And it really, like, as I was writing the dissertation and part of what I talk about in the piece is how writing can feel very solitary sometimes, or you can think about yourself, you can feel like you're an individual, but, and part of what I was playing with in the dissertation um, was that it's not an individual endeavor and trying to see myself as a, well, trying to understand myself as a more than human being writing this work in collaboration with many other human and more than human beings. Um, and so the editorial process was very much in that spirit. The, the piece that emerged um, that you can find in the link was really through dialogue with Dina and Michelle and their encouragement to take it into different directions. And, so instead of, so the piece itself was very much a reflective piece about the tensions of writing a dissertation on reimagining education within this crack, you know, seeing the dissertation as a crack within the modern colonial architecture of the university. Um, and then and then playing with the tensions that are present in that and, and both the gifts and the challenges that, that can emerge from that site. Um, and so after the piece was published, like Albert said, there's just this, I had, I had a huge vulnerability hangover <laughs> the next day of just like, oh my gosh, I really just put my heart and soul out into the world. Um, and, but it, it also felt very beautiful and like a real gift to be able to share the, the work in that way. Um, I, a dissertation, the dissertation is like 400 pages long. It's an academic document. It's not so digestible for most people, um, even though I tried to write it in a, a creative way. Um, but the, the piece I published for Ecoversities, I felt like had, it has the heart and soul of the dissertation in it. Part of, you know, the, there are a few poems from the dissertation, one of which I'll close my sharing here with in a moment. Um, but that, uh, yeah, it, it was able to re, to move out into the world in a different way, I think, through through the Ecoversities publication. And then a few weeks ago in the lead up to this conference, um, Sierra and Salo, who you saw, if you were at the opening ceremony, you saw Sierra and Salo, 
um, they created this Instagram reel out of the findings poem of my dissertation. So there are two findings chapters and then I, I wrote a poem trying to poetically describe the findings in a, a more concise way. And um, they, and I'll try um, in a little bit maybe to post the link to the reel, but it was a total surprise. I logged into Instagram one day and there was this poem. So, and it, that was just a huge gift and that reaches people in a totally different way. Um, and so thank you, Katarina, for the, the time check. I will, I'll wrap it up here in a, a moment. Um, but to kind of what Albert was speaking to in like the way these, the words move in the world in these different ways and ways we can't see. I mean, those are ways the peace has moved in the world. And then even rereading it, um, I was meeting like a different version of myself. I, I opened the piece by talking about how I'm sitting in the crack of writing a dissertation in the university. And that's not the precise crack that I'm sitting in anymore or now. It's, and I've been thinking about it. I'm like, maybe it is the same crack, but just a different part of the crack <laughs> in a different building down, you know, in another part of the world because I am... I'm in higher education. I'm teaching at the University for Peace in a master's program. So it's it's similar and yet also a different place. And so when I was rereading my piece um, in leading up to this panel, I, I was meeting myself again. And then finally, this panel feels like a way that these pieces that we've written also <clears throat> will move in the world in different ways. And I'm excited to see about how they move in the conversation we have together. So just to conclude my words, I'd like to share a, a little, um, like a prayer um, that's part of the findings poem. So not the whole findings poem, but just the, the end of it. May we ask questions that may not have answers and be willing to be bewildered. May we reorient ourselves and be willing to get lost, not knowing where we are heading. May we be seeds in the cracks of the colonial capitalist white supremacist patriarchy, growing other worlds where many fit, vines reaching towards other wises out of and beyond ivory tower cracks. May we learn, unlearn and learn beyond towards a world where it's easier to love May we learn and unlearn to decolonize. May we learn to be in service to life. May our actions be more honorable. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, yep, one more minute, is there? Anything else you would like to say? You are wrapped up. <laughs> Thank you. Up next, we have uh, Riham. And um, I would like to invite you to introduce yourself with two okay. normal facts and two out-of-the-box facts, like surprises that no one knows about you. Actually, anything that I'm going to say, nobody knows about me because this is my first time. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so uh, two facts. Uh, I'm a writer. I'm a writer and uh, I, I like learning a lot. I like learning. Okay. Uh, two other facts that nobody knows about me. Uh, I got three cats. Okay, uh, you might find them coming, being invited to the circle soon. Uh, and uh, what else? I cook. I cook very good. I cook very good, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for having this, for drawing this circle. Um, actually, when, when, this is my first time to come closer to the ecoversities community and uh, the whole process of publishing my, my paper. 
it wasn't new for me because I'm an independent researcher and I'm a writer as well. But the thing is that I usually, when I publish something, um, a poetry, a, a story or an article, I never go back and read it again. And I feel that I want to release it. I, I want to put it out there and just find a place and hide. Uh, but for the first time for me, it, doesn't, it, it didn't happen the same way with the ecoversities because I felt that it is not about something that it is not about piece of writing uh, that can be read in different uh, timing or in different occasions, but it is having this conversation. It's open a dialogue with people I've never met before who can find beyond the words find beyond the concept that is mentioned in the paper itself. And the best part for me is the whole, the whole writing that I contributed with, it was about the words, um, especially a very special word that is Ubuntu. And I would love to um, invite you for, uh, for the journey, just a, a very quick to introduce the concept, the, uh, the to navigate with me on the journey, how I learned this word and how I put it on a paper and how I want to share it with all of us today. Maybe we come up with something different and this is the whole point of imagining and reimagining and recreating once more. Are you ready? Okay, let's start. I will share the screen. Oh. Uh, is it clear for everyone? Okay, thank you. Um, my journey with the publication with the Eco Universities, uh, Eco Versities, it was about the word Ubuntu. And I chose to um, narrate my story about the Ubuntu, about this word from personal linguistic and pedagogical indigenous narratives. Um, and I started from the imagination because most of the times I feel myself, I find myself in the imagination. Um, it's the, the field where I can find the solutions easily. It's the field where, where everything comes much clearer for me. Can anyone identify with this? Yeah? What does, it, what does she represent for you? Okay. Have you loved her? Have you got any stories about her? Okay. Uh, for me, Alice uh, was my companion and my, it wasn't only a cartoon where I, I spent a lot of time when I was a child. For me, it was the dynamics that Alice herself find herself in the world and she followed something beyond beyond the reality. She always uh, followed her imagination. And um, while I was following her rabbit, the rabbit for me was the words. I find myself that most of the time I'm so, so possessed about what this word means. And I, I do not mean the word as it is written or as it is spelled or it is uh, given from a dictionary. I always possess by the idea what the word itself might um, bring a magic to life from, from some kind of a place of strength. I notice myself as a kind, I would like to introduce this is, uh, this is my art. Uh, I usually learn by starting in the middle from the center. I start with one word at any issue in my life, any, any, any situation, I usually transform it into words. I start with a word and from this word, I start creating as many words as I can around this word. And the idea is that it is not about accumulating words from the dictionary, it's about, I want to dig deeper to find out what, what is the exact word. Um, and if you have been in the process of writing before, you would, you would resonate with the struggle of the writers to find the right word, the exact word, the core. 
I, so most of the time I want to dig deeper to find out what this word really means. While I'm doing this, something really interesting happens is that uh, I start asking myself, what if there is a kind of uh, perennial uh, words? What if there is a kind of a perennial language? Um, there is a concept that I learned from the theater. It's called the red thread. A red thread uh, technique when a group of strangers come together and everyone is telling a story. And out of the blue, you find there is an invisible thread that connects and weaves all the stories. So I start asking myself, what if the same red thread we can find in the words and in the language itself? So it's somehow weaving all these decor, decor the monad words uh, into some kind of a perennial language. And then I, I went on my search about the uh, perennial uh, word and perennial language. I kept on, on working on the uh, words and how they are constructing knowledge for me um, because I felt it's very, it's very important and it's very uh, crucial for me to create a knowledge that is very similar to how I think, to how I want to see the world. And it seems that I really find myself when I'm doing some kind of a linguistic accompanied with artistic part. While I'm doing my circles, I have no idea why I'm doing the circles. What is the symbolism of a circle? All I know is in a circle, we can see each other and there are no sharp edges. So each one of us has a stand on a circle and each one can see each other. While I was doing some kind of research, I came up to this picture and I immediately, fall in love with the picture with the people i thought that this is a kind of a ritual or something but when i start searching about what is this i came with my rabbit with my word it was ubuntu uh ubuntu is one of the uh indigenous pedagogies uh in the zulu culture i, I gave myself permission to open up and to learn about this didactically, what it brings to me in person, what it brings to the learning environment, to the curriculum, um, to the most important thing is that how, how people from the Zulu culture start finding out the different layers of meaning about this word, this single word, and they are trying to find it relevant to their culture and to their intellectual frameworks. So I came to this moment of realization, it is not about writing a word or saying the word, but it's much important about finding your own framework or I don't go for using the word frame a lot, but it's finding the core or the perennial um, or the red thread that connects the word, that connects the uh, different methodologies, even if you are living in one place and what is happening in different places totally. Ubuntu for me, what I found from uh, digging deeply about Ubuntu, I find that I love that. I'm a human because I belong. I participate, I share, I am because you are. It seems for me like an ethical code some kind, if I'm going to use the word ethical, but let me say it's a human code where um, each individual finds himself or herself in a circle without being enmeshed with the collective and at the same time tries to, to belong to a community and tries to make some kind of a sharing and offering for this community where one stands and move on from this spot together forward. Um, so um, I dig much deeper about the Ubuntu. I find that they are not just using the word, they, they, they are building different uh, dynamics about it. Uh, one of this is the, the, the paradigm that, have, uh, that has five uh, dimensions. And each one of them, I started applying for myself first while writing the article. 
And while publishing in the process of communicating with the editors and while presenting it the Ubuntu, uh, the package later on in whatever learning settings I've been doing since 2017. Uh, so it, it feels for me like I internalized the word somehow. But while I'm doing this, I, I learned something from the Zulu culture that it's very important to make this um, you got the you got the deeper meaning of a word, but it's much better to find the 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 parallel meaning from your culture and from your from your language. And this is what I try to communicate in my in my piece of writing. It's my search of my own rabbits. It's my search for where my imagination can lead me to places where I've never been before. It's um, it's finding out that. Ubuntu have the same meaning in, in Arabic culture and I find it in two words and it's not a matter of opening a dictionary and finding the, uh, the similar words. There are several similar words, but I wanted, as, as I mentioned before, I want the perennial language, the language that connects all of us without knowing this language, without knowing the label or the name. And I find two words that is very close to Ubuntu. Uh, so I, I, I feel that I find my red thread that's coming from the Zulu culture and from the Arabic culture. And the two words are Ithar, and one of them in the picture, as you see. And the second one is Ihsan. And the moment I hold the just the beginning of the red thread, I start weaving it in my learning, I wouldn't say teaching, but facilitating environments and the magic happens. And, and I try to uh, communicate this through the writing, how many things happened while I'm moving with this perennial language and the red thread um, into different applications. This is one um, group of human circle that happened while we were asking ourselves what is Ubuntu means to us, what is Ihsan means to us, what being human means to us. And I have no idea what is the answer is gonna be, but each one in the circle came up with something that is totally magical for me. And you know this moment when the flow happens and you just step back and you feel that, yes, I'm connected, I, I belong to this group. Um, so much, much details, uh, I do not want to take a long time, but much, much details it is in the paper itself. You will find it with the title Ubuntu. And the most important thing for me is that um, I am because you are. And the process of writing doesn't stop by publishing a paper of, or publishing a book. The whole process is about creating new spaces where we can see each other, connect with each other. And like in the Ubuntu, it's like holding our hands together and belong to something bigger than ourselves and be willing to share it outside. And that's it. And if you want to, uh, to find out how to follow your rabbits, find your allies, go for some kind of creative adventures. I would like so much to be invited in your communities uh, to do so with language, playing with the language words and what people on the ground really communicate and how they learn. Thank you. Thank you, Riham. Thank you. Now we are going to our last speaker. Um, he's Sean Finan. He's a multi-species interdisciplinary artist. He collaborates with fungi, with sheep, with humans, with semiconductors, birds. Um, his works have been shown in various countries around Europe. Um, I'm not sure if you want to follow the tradition and share something about yourself that nobody 
knows about you. Uh -huh. It's an interesting question, whether it's something that nobody knows. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if I don't know something about myself as well, that maybe I can try and share. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Albert. Um, um, maybe the thing that uh, the thing that I do, I, I am a visual artist and also a trained computer scientist. So I kind of walk those two worlds a little bit. And that's what I'm going to speak about. Um, the thing that you don't know, the thing that you don't know, actually, this is this will lead nicely into what I'm going to I'm going to invite everybody to do in a second. But I, I'm spending quite a lot of time making kin with a lichen, which you can kind of see in this rock at the minute. It's got these like creates these lovely cracked edges, and the cracks are a thing called a prothallus, which is the fungal body of the lichen. Uh, when it's growing out, it creates these sort of shapes that are in between. And lichen are amazing because they're they're entirely symbiotic. Like so, they they they're not one thing. They're all they have to coexist in order to survive. So they're green plant and um, fungi at the same time. So yes, and I won't I won't uh, speak particularly long. So thank you very much for that um, introduction. And um, so I I thank you uh, also so to Albert and Katerina, uh, Mahi and everybody at Ecoversities for the invitation to uh, be part of this panel and also Stephanie and Miham for the the sharing already and I look forward to the conversation and the questions. Um. I wanted to start with an invitation to just give everybody a chance to move a little bit or just kind of take a, a second away or 30 seconds away from the, the screen because I know that these can be very long days. Um, and uh, following Albert's um, quite coincidental invitation, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask to, you to bring a stone for our stone soup. But if you have something kind of stone or stone like somewhere nearby, sand is fine as well. Um, or something made out of clay or made out of soil is also fine too. Just to have in your hand while I speak, I'm going to, uh, yeah, super. And I'll just give it about 30 seconds and then I'll, I'll uh, start into this again. <laughs> That's nice, Mahi, I don't know what that is. It's a stone and a jewel, oh, cool. Ah, brilliant. Is that a shell? Ah, nice, Bridget. That's really cool. The shells that make the stones. Wonderful. M Michael, yours is particularly um, rectangular. I can't, I can't tell it from the, just the shine that's on it. Like, oh, this is, oh, I like the cup as well. Um, ceramic is quite nice. bronze. Actually. Sorry, Michael, say that again. I was cheating. It's 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 bronze. A bronze. It's bronze. Uh, well, even even possibly even better. And this is I'll actually speak to this in a second. Like, thank you, Michael. That's fantastic. Um, because it, I mean, it's all it's all connected anyway. A stone is not really just a stone, and these things all they, they all link in together. So um, and southernite are fantastic. Um, so thank you for taking that time. I'm going to keep moving as well because I'm also conscious of time, but um, uh, thank you for, for seeing through this invitation. What you might see on this, besides the, the amazing lichen that I'm working with, is there's there's also a seam of silica that is running down through this stone here. Uh, and that silica, silica is a mineral that is uh, unearthed by stone over a very long period of time. So we're talking millions of years. And the movement of the stone allows the silica to kind of combine and coalesce and come together and then it gets pushed up to the surface and when human beings started using, well, I mean silica comes through lots of different things, silica crushed into sand is washed up on our beaches all the time but when we started to harvest and extract silica we used it for various different things, I say we as like the human species and kind of putting us all into a big royal we there that maybe I shouldn't include us all in. Um, so my apologies on that. Um, but the silica is also quite important for what we're doing right now because um, everything in contemporary computing or modern computing is run, is created through silica or silicon, um, but silica is the mineral that silicon is made from. And transistors in particular, which are completely crucial in all modern computing are made mostly from silicon. Um, but holding these things in our hands and just kind of keeping a, an awareness of it, um, whenever I turn on a device or whenever I um, use pretty much anything, I mean, I'm, I'm a creative coder, so I write a lot of computer programs and this is part of my, my work as an artist, but I always try to acknowledge that these things come from this. Uh, they come from materials and minerals. They are tied entirely to this earth that we're on. Um, and I think it's very easy to disconnect ourselves from these things sometimes. So 
Um, and those disconnections and layers of abstraction are part of the behavior, patterns of behavior that I think Stephanie has already spoken to this idea of colonial patterns and decolonization and unlearning. And I also think Reham speak, similarly is speaking to the idea of Ubuntu and the, the kind of the overall connectedness of all of these things. I think that I, I hope that I'm kind of topping and tailing this a, a, a little bit with something. Um, so this is really what I've written about in the, the Ecoversities piece. I don't want to, to kind of like explore it in too much depth because you can read the piece and it's there and we can have these conversations. Um, what I did want to speak about was the extension of these things into behaviours. So acknowledging our connectedness with the minerals and materials and so on that we have on this earth while we're using technologies. I also find it's very important to consider how and why we use technologies. And this is what my work is mostly about as well, but it's also what this written piece is about. And one of the offerings that I offered within the piece is that um, refusal can be a very powerful tool in our arsenal when we're when we're using technologies. Um, and I'm going to pick on Zoom. So I'm sorry, Katerina, as well. I'm also going to ask people to do the thing that was the opposite of what you said. It's lovely to see all the faces, but I'm going to ask everybody to turn off the camera for a second, actually. And I'm just going to, just so that we can, uh, we can talk to something. I'm also turning off my own, still considering these stones and considering our material uh, connectedness. Um, what we've just done is actually saved an extraordinary amount of electrical energy. Um, every pixel on every screen that is captured and transferred across from my computer to all of your computers, each pixel, and there are millions of those on each image, um, carries with it four pieces of data um, which are broken down into electrical energy and they're transferred every second. Um, there's an, there is an extraordinary amount of electrical cost involved in doing these things. And while I'm always very grateful for the technologies that we have that allow us to be so connected, I always think I also think that it's quite um, an important thing to remember how we use and how we choose to use these things and just to acknowledge that energy use and electrical use is, is a part of all, the, all of these processes. I, I'm, I welcome kind of videos to come back on actually I'm not going to this isn't this isn't virtue sig signaling and this isn't a, an attempt to kind of like um, prejudice or judge people on the use of these things it's just a kind of an acknowledgement or a reminder that while we use we can kind of consider and we can always kind of think about these things as well. So when we were talking about like Ubuntu or when we're talking about decolonization, we can also think about the tools and the tools that we use. So going back to our stone technologies, like, I mean, technologies are made up of these minerals, but technologies are also, as the philosopher, the French philosopher would have argued, would have uh, termed it, uh, sorry, uh, Bernard Stiegler would have termed it um, organized inorganic matter. We can create technologies and we can also choose how to use those technologies. This is a technology as and when I start to use it to extend my own body into something else. Um, and so is this thing that I'm speaking through. Um, so that's really what the piece that I've written speaks to, and it's also what I would like to kind of consider and maybe like invite some consideration of in the Q&A, but I didn't want to speak kind of any more too much to the piece, and I'm kind of, I'm quite happy to finish it there unless there's any sort of like follow on or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Then now we are going to a collective Q&A. If anyone has a question, um please feel free to unmute yourselves and declare it even if it's not uh, really formulated yet but the beginning of a reflection Well, I think the reflection already began. There were three very reflective pieces, um, well, describing what sounded like very reflective pieces of work. Um, and I, I was kind of interested in the, coming back to the point Shane just made about technology and the choice to use it. Um, and I just had a very quick look at some of Stephanie's work, and she's talking about writing in text, but doubting, but aware of its abused power in science. Um, and and, and um, Reham's playing, uh, well, playing in a serious way with words and, and really treating the words, individual words with respect and giving them a different view. 
and then Shane comes on with his uh, silicon um, and, to, uh, and raises the issue of the use of tools. And I, I'm just very interested in what people think. I've seen some things on the program about um, the use of AI uh, and whether, I, I don't know, I will see, we can see what people say tomorrow at these sessions where they talk about its possible role in ecoversity education, but I personally am very skeptical about such roles. I feel um, more that the ecoversity route might be a, a, in, in going deeper into things of, of and of, you know, so I'd just be very interested to, to know whether that resonates with any of the three speakers we've had in, in their work you know how they basically see their work and technology and whether it's it's a positive or in, in the way it is most used and profited from the, the, you know a very positive um tool or something actually we should be very um critical and suspicious of hello folks um, I'm Bridget. Thank you so much for this for sharing here. It's really, really special. Um, I just wanted to share something that felt incredibly synchronistic um, with Stephanie's work. Um, I'm writing at the moment from a very similar research perspective of reimagining the university from the inside through kind of, um, yeah, radical pedagogies. And Stephanie's description in the poem, it touched um, an image that came to me today. I just want to read a bit part of the poem again. May we be seeds in the cracks of the colonial capitalist white supremacist patriarchy, growing other worlds where many fit. And this image came to me today to try and describe the one's place within a university trying to understand and this image of the, the calabash as the university system, the brittle shell, our very idea of what education means, our, as in the education, the academic system, um, seeing itself as education um, only within designated inaccessible spaces, um, the gates, the pedagogies, the, the the, the, the stuckness of the way the system sees itself with this narrow neck of hierarchy and the many doing towards the, the base of the calabash. And so closed and inaccessible, slow to change, but slowly decaying. Um, and some calabashes are painted and with beautiful colors. And, but I, it made me think of all the patterns and the colonial patterns that exist within this very stuck system. But then the way the brittleness lends itself to be played as an instrument and also it can develop cracks. And I, I came, this image came to me today of cracks within the calabash and that inside are the seeds, the seeds of, of possibility and, and the way in which when you cut the calabash at the top, to, to, you can make a gourd from it. So you literally decapitate the hierarchy, pour water into it. And through that, the water and the seeds is what creates, it means life and life is learning. And just having this, this image came so powerfully today and, and hearing your poem, it really, um, it just brought it to life through poetry in such a beautiful way. So I just wanted to share my gratitude and to this space and to all of you. Oh my goodness, thank you for sharing that, Bridget. Um, it's really beautiful. I have to, so you and Ishtar, who is here, is also working on a dissertation on a similar theme. So I'm immediately like, you two should get, you know, we'll all keep connecting, yes. <laughs> um, and then Vanessa, who's here, I just wrote a piece for a magazine that Vanessa edited, and I talk about in this, it, the piece is about re-enchanting education and teaching as magical praxis. And Reham, you talked about magic in your piece, and I know we share this like love of the magic of words and how they act in the world, and yet there's action that comes after we put the words out into the world. But in the piece I wrote um, for Vanessa's um, 
uh, magazine that she's editing, I talk about how if we re-enchant education within the institution, like right now, the institution that I'm in feels very receptive to it. And I'm having an utterly magical experience <laughs> teaching within it. And then I, I have this dialogue with myself where I'm like, but will I be able to continue? And, um, you know, I hope, I hope that I can. And then, but then what if, if we do re-enchant the university, will those seeds grow so that they ultimately end up composting the university on the jungle floor and it becomes something new? So I'm sharing similar images. I'm yeah teaching in Costa Rica. So the, the, the composting that happens in the tropical life cycle is very rapid and um, it's, it's very visible at all times. And um, yeah, I encourage you, Bridget, to play with that image more. I love it. And I'm going to put some questions in the chat. I had written some like reflection questions yesterday that I thought I would share with you all. And one of them is like, how are you a seed in the cracks or how can you be a seed in the cracks? So I think Vanessa's ma the magazine's not out yet, but maybe Vanessa, you can let people know how to connect with that. Yes, it is the magazine of the Peace Chronicle and it will be on the website, but maybe I can somehow email it out or uh, something like that. There will be a digital copy as well as a physical copy. Thank you. We have um, a couple of minutes left. I also wanted to, uh, I was thinking maybe it's a lot of pressure because you received some information for an hour and maybe you're not uh, yet ready to uh, re um, uh, put in words your reflections. We have um, for uh, a recently created forum uh, for uh, uh, ecoversities, for reimagining education for this conference. So this is the place to go and uh, share whatever reflections you've been having about any session that you are attending and people can join in and um, uh, extend everything that is talked about throughout these days and beyond. So I'll also post the link here. Uh, and uh, while we are here and we can see each other's faces, if you have some emerging images, um, sounds that are coming to you, uh, this you, you still have the floor um, yeah and I'll post here the link with the forum then Um, one thing I've been thinking about, and it maybe relates to your question a little, Mike, but it came from your piece, Shane, was the idea of partial refusal. Um, I've really, I feel like that's so, mm, I don't know, it helped me think a lot about some of these technologies I can't necessarily refuse and, or it's very difficult to, but thinking about ways I can partially refuse them was really helpful to me. And so, I don't know how that may connect with AI, but uh, but I think it might. I think it, it could connect there. I, I think that there's also that idea that things must be static. It has to be either or a lot of the time where it can actually just be a fluid both. There's no, there's no necessity to say, I will not do something. It's just, I will try not to do something. It's a much easier way, I think, also to respond to something. Um, because it doesn't put so much pressure on on a single person as well, like on whatever action it is that they choose to do or to not do. Um, I think that, that can, I mean, personally, I feel that that's a, it's not a bad thing to have throughout life in general, like not just from a point of view of technology, but from a point of view of fluid res refusal in, in any sort of like scenario. Yeah. I had just said as well, then Mike, in response there, I, I mean, I don't, I, I, I half worked in AI for about six years in a university, so I have some kind of grounding in this area, but I tend to share your skepticism, but I think Kate Crawford's book is pretty comprehensive, and she also goes into detail in the, um, the material um, uh, extract 
activism that runs behind AI before then also digging into the uh, the problems, the contemporary problems with both bias that is embedded within AI and also the um, the uh, ownership of the systems and the structures that go behind it. Like so, there, yeah, there's a lot to dig into there, and it's a whole it's a whole other conversation. I don't know how much this will be brought up tomorrow either. Actually, I'd be kind of curious myself, Tim. I, I don't know if there's going to be much more of a chance to say it, but it's it's a I did want to just also say like it there is a really uh, and I think Stephanie and Reham and I kind of acknowledged this in our in our email conversations before this before this started, but the, there's there's a really wonderful overlap between the the different writings that we have, and I'm very glad to share this panel. It's it's not a huge amount of time to have these like conversations, and I, I feel that over like months you could thread out some quite amazing conversations. But like of course these things can't happen necessarily over months. And right now I'm very grateful to both of you and to everybody else who's who shared this space with us just for this chance to to share just a little and to just kind of open up that conversation. Um. We are closing. Um, did you have uh, Did you have um, any last words, um, Rihan, before each of us goes I'm just away? I'm trying to send some hearts for everyone. So <laughs> I'm sending cards for everyone. Thank you so much for holding this space to us. And it's totally starts from here, but doesn't end. So let's let's build on this. It's very inspiring. And um, where we can find um, each of you? Where we can find more? Uh, for me, I can write my email. Is it okay for everyone? Okay. Oh, and I have a sub stack I just started writing. I will share that link as well. <laughs> like, that's a good place to connect with me too. I got some links, but they are in Arabic. So if anyone is interested in reading in Arabic, you're most welcome. The sub stack was actually inspired by the piece that I wrote for the Vanessa's journal that I was talking about. It's called Enchantable. So it's a lot about re, re enchanting education and, and the magic of teaching and learning and unlearning spaces. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Let's uh, make sure to have some time before the next session to move, to get some water, uh, to take care of yourselves, ourselves. Thank you so much for coming. Have a wonderful break and we'll see each other over the next days. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so Bye. much.